Hi everybody, my name is Pius Chen and I am super honored to be here presenting this to you today. Um, there are so many talented and smart and dedicated professionals out there. I am really humbled to be working alongside all of you. So thank you for sitting with me today. Now, before we start, I just want to say that by no means do I know more of anything than any of you. We all simply just know the same things framed by different points of views. And I'm, I'm really just here to share mine and, and hopefully learn some of yours later. So please, take what I'm saying to you today and take what makes sense to you in your world and put your own voice to it and, and, and really make it your own. Now, I'm going to go into the reason why we're here today, uh, which is to talk about client goal setting what they are, why they're important, and then how to find them. And then once you discover all of the what's and the why's through the how's, I'm gonna to touch a bit on some of the processes to drive the client's purpose, leading them straight into realizing the value of your services and software. Now there's a lot to cover on the topic of goals and goal setting. It's a huge topic with strategies like goal setting, uh, smart goal setting, business impact analytics, EBRs and etc. And we won't be able to go through all of it today in our in our half an hour together. Um, but today we're going to talk about why goal setting is essential to your clients to stay focused and motivated in the early stages in order to realize long term value of your partnership. So what purpose does it serve us to keep our customers motivated as an organization and as an individual contributor? You know, by keeping clients aligned, focused, and motivated, you can achieve adoption, which is the workday goal of most customer success professionals. And by presenting value to the organization, you can achieve expansion, which benefits the organization and everybody as a whole, which is the workday goal of most organizations. But these are our goals, right? Now, our goals as customer success folks is really to ensure that the customer adopts what we're trying to teach them to ensure that they see value in it and then to continue to use the tools and teachings properly after we leave them, like a legacy. Now, a lot of this I look as similar to raising kids, raising children. Who has kids out there? Now, I know some of you are raising your hands, some of you aren't. So for those of you that don't have kids, do you know what raising kids is like? Well, for those of you that don't know, they're pretty much like our customers when they first come to us. They're clueless, they're needy, but only when they need you because if you need them to do something, forget it. Now you want them to do well. You need them to do well. You're teaching them how to do something that you know how to do well, but they don't know it all. Now you're the expert in whatever space you're in and they're not, but you want them to be experts too, to be self-sufficient. So how do you ensure that they work with you to achieve those goals that you need them to achieve? How do you ensure that in order to see the value that you're trying to bring them? How do we turn them from this, a classroom full of crazy kids, to this? See, it's, it's really up to us to frame the end game in a way that makes sense to them, in their world, to their needs, to their goals, and their purposes, not yours. I mean, sure, you might be enthusiastic and excited about it, but it's our job to be, it's our whole job to be, and as both parents and as customer success professionals, we worry about them. We think about them way more than they do about us because they have other things to do. They have other priorities and sadly, you're, you're just not their priority. You're, you're a part of their lives for a moment, like a commercial, while they watch the real show. You know, sometimes we'll sit through it and watch and other times we'll go to the bathroom or the kitchen. And I, I really hope I'm not dating myself by talking about commercials I don't even know who has cable anymore still, but you know, if you watch YouTube, there's always that commercial in the beginning of those, those videos and we're always waiting that five seconds before we can click skip, skip, skip. But either way, you know, however you consume your media, you're not the main attraction to their workday. Now think about your customers on a day to day, what they do and the actual job that they need to get done. And maybe you're an onboarding specialist who needs a list from a stalling customer to move things forward. Or you're a CSM with a training session or a QBR call scheduled with a customer who keeps no-showing or they keep postponing. Uh, don't take offense. I mean, really, they're just, they're just busy. And what you need isn't their priority, and that's just the reality of it. So how do you get them to stay focused 
and motivated and moving forward in the customer journey? How do we get them to use a new process, a workflow, and adopt the change? How do you get them not to be the bottleneck in the process of something that will ultimately help them? How do you get these people to sit down and watch the commercial? You do that by making those commercials relevant to them, by making them about them. You know, ones that speaks to them, ones that connects with them. You know, back in the day, um, commercials used to play at times suited to their audience. If you're a kid watching Saturday morning cartoons, they'd be showing commercials for toys. And then afterwards, the kids would run to their parents and say, I want that because I saw the whole commercial and, and they want it. Got them excited. And during late night TV, shows like Married with Children, they'd advertise things like alcohol because that's what parents need. <laughs> and now there's online targeted ads that focus on person's likes, their dislikes, and they send ads their ways based on their viewing or buying behavior. It's very targeted, it's very relevant. And our customers are no different. It's all around relevancy. So how do you get them to sit and watch the commercial? By answering the question, what's in it for them? Make their needs, their interests, their pains, the problems, the focus, make that the center of the universe. What are they? Now, this is really the what portion of goal setting. What's important to them? What are their goals? Now, let's let's take a step back in something larger than our professional roles, but back, back to people as, as a whole, back to humanity. Why do people set goals? Pretty much to make sure that we're on track with why we're doing things, um, to give us a destination, a focal point to go towards, to have something to achieve to become more, to do more, to be better than we are today, or really just to achieve a person's ambition or effort to attain some kind of desired result. Now, all of these things really point to something bigger, something beyond the goal, because really, we only set goals to achieve our purpose. And this is really inherent in human beings for as long as time. Now, our caveman ancestors would go hunting for days, and their goal was to catch something. But the purpose goes beyond that. The purpose was to feed their families, to ensure that life continues. And that's the deeper meaning and purpose behind the goal of catching something. I mean, alone the goal isn't enough to motivate to an end. I mean, maybe to motivate for a day or two, but after I've been in the woods or on the plains or wherever tracking an animal for a couple days, my goal, my new goal would be to go home and sleep. To, to go home and rest, right? But my purpose doesn't allow me to do that. My purpose keeps me going. My purpose is to feed my family, to feed my tribe. And that's not going to stop. That's not gonna go away. So the goal becomes a focal point to work towards completion. Now, I'd like to challenge all of you to think one step past the goal for the purpose. Now, I know today the topic was around goal setting, but I'd like to really challenge you to think of it as purpose setting. And that changes, that changes everything. Now the goals are the what of it all, but the purpose is the why of it. And the why gives you the motivation. It gives you the drive and the will to achieve that goal. Now hitting your goal is really just a byproduct. It's, it's a collateral positive to achieving your purpose. Do we have any runners in the, in the audience? Do we have any marathon runners, any, any, any racers of any kind? Now the reason I ask, is because for the runners, when you're running, there are 10,000 other runners out there with you, all with the same goal of crossing that finish line alive and not dying along the way, but all with different purposes for why they wanna do that goal. Now, I've, I've run the Vancouver Sun Run, um, I've run the Vancouver uh, Underwear Affair, and for those of you that don't know, the Underwear Affair is put on by the BC Cancer Foundation. Um, it's a 10K run in your underwear around Stanley Park um, to raise funds for cancer awareness. And when I did it, the few years that I did it, my sister was my purpose. She had cancer. She beat it, but she was my motivation to keep going. And I did. I never gave up because of her. And as many people as there are running this race is as many different purposes that there are because purposes are personal. Now, I'm always fascinated by other people's reasons for doing things. And I, I really would encourage you to, to do the same and be curious about other people's purposes for doing things, whether in a professional environment or a personal environment. And what you discover might really surprise you in, in terms of how different people think than you, shock, shock. And that while you thought they had the same goals as you, 
their purpose for doing things might be different than yours. Now, as customer experience professionals, is one is one of our responsibilities to really understand our customer's purpose so we can help them towards it. And how do we do that? We, we have to discover what their purpose is. And in this discovery phase is where we uncover those purposes and goals and personal pains and challenges. Now, peeling back the layers to, to really get to the real purpose. And this is really the how in the process. Um, we, we've had the what with what are their goals and the why with the purpose. And now we're uncovering how, how to find these goals and purposes. Now, a quick background uh, story in one of my experiences. I, I started my professional career um, about 20 years ago at Enterprise Rent-A-Car as a corporate accounts manager, offering our fleet replacement courtesy car services to body shops and dealerships. Now, today it's, it's pretty normal. You know, you crash your car, you bring your car to a dealership or body shop to fix, and they just rent you a car as, as a courtesy car. But 20 years ago, it was revolutionary. And to go around to body shops and dealerships and to ask them to lose their fleet of courtesy cars and to rent from us instead was was pretty cool. Um, and the, I, I, I discovered other people's purposes for doing things when I spoke to a few different body shops and they had different reasons for wanting to rent cars from us. My goal was to have them rent cars from us, but their purpose really was, was different. Um, you know, two, two shops that I spoke with, one said that they didn't want to keep a fleet of courtesy cars around because it just took up too much space in, in their parking lot. And another uh, body shop had told me that they didn't want their technicians working on their own internal fleet of courtesy cars because it took away time from working on customer cars. Now they ended up renting from me eventually, but when I went back to do the you know monthly reviews or quarterly reviews or, or whatever they were, I didn't focus on you know your your user adoption rate is X percent. You're renting X amount of cars from me because that didn't really matter to them. I mean, those were my goals, but it didn't matter to the customer at all. For us, we were able to focus in on. You know, hey, how's how's uh, your parking lot now that you don't have to house all of these these courtesy cars? And the owner told me that they were able to increase another bay. They're increased to build another bay, and increase the throughput of of their fixed customers' vehicles, which helped increase their revenue. And the other, you know, uh, owner told me that now that their technicians didn't have to focus and worry about fixing their own internal fleets, they were able to increase their proficiency with fixing customer cars, which also helped increase revenue. So by really discovering what they were and having their purpose on mind, I was still able to achieve my goal, right? Now I was able to frame it favorably to them and give them the business impact numbers because my team had discovered their end game. We discovered their purpose through just questioning and just through being naturally curious. And I think this is the first and most important step in purpose setting. Now it's really hard to discover someone's purpose without learning more about them. And typically it's not something that you can achieve in one conversation. You know, it takes relationships, it takes rapport, and it takes trust in order for someone to open up that much to you, to go past the goals and go into purpose. But to be genuinely curious about a customer's world goes a long way in discovery and how you present your questions and in the types of questions you ask. So how, how do you adopt this habit if it's not something that comes naturally to you? How do you adopt curiosity? Now the easiest way that I found to do this was to think like a child. Now this is my daughter and her name is Emmeline and she's three. Now, kids are so naturally very curious because they're a blank slate. They have no presumptions, they have no ego, and really they just don't stop digging because they know they don't know anything, but they want to. So they persist. And to lose that curiosity, you sort of settle into a state of stagnation and, and, and you start dropping. Um, to go into a little bit of a story uh, about a company that I used to work with, Xerox, they did a study back in the early 2000s uh, on their sales reps' performance, and they discovered something really interesting. You know, their sales reps started doing well around the five month mark when they started learning about the industry and, and process and whatnot. But they continued to rise up until the 18th month mark when it plateaued and they all started to drop. This was a really curious behavior, and Xerox looked into it. And they found that the reps stopped asking questions because around the 18th month mark, on average, they thought they knew everything. They became experts. They stopped being curious 
And simply you could just walk into a client's uh, account and office and instantly look at the number of people that work there, the throughput that they were putting out in terms of print, and instantly diagnose, hey, Mr. Customer, you need a 50 page black and white printer, you know, in that corner over there and saying it cost you X amount of dollars. Now they were able to diagnose the customer's environment and assign goals based on basic questions, but they didn't ask more. They never built the rapport with the customers. They never discovered their purpose to tie it back to their customer's needs. And this led to lower performance based on the customers not being able to see the value for the cost of everything. Now, most times when good intention reps are in the discovery phase, they'll ask questions. And finally, you know, they'll hone in on one of these three conclusions, either save time, save money or make money. Now, these are the three main reasons people buy SaaS tools, but essentially these are the three main goals that everybody has. I mean, I personally would love to save time, save money and make more money. And this is where you get high level goals like streamline operations. I'm gonna help increase productivity. I'm gonna cut down your rogue spending. Uh, I mean, these technically are goals, but they're not purposes. They're pretty much the same goal as the 10,000 other runners of cross that finish line. Now for most people, purpose is tied to emotion. There's feeling around it. And when it's personal, there's motivation and there's drive. And when you can connect a goal to an emotion, it becomes a purpose. And then people are more inclined to carry through to achieve that purpose. Like our caveman friend who needed to feed his family. That's an emotional bond, that's an emotional tie. Now here at Procurify, as a hypothetical, real world, potential use case example, you know, often we have prospective customers coming to us and after a few discovery sessions, we find out that they need a workflow solution because maybe they think they're losing money through rogue spending. And maybe just a small percentage of their employees are requesting purchases and majority just buy an expensive after fact. It's not tracked, it's a mess. So our inclination is to prescribe based on our experiences, a lot like those Xerox reps. And we say, okay, Mr. Customer, Ms. Customer, your goal is to cut down your rogue spending by X percent. And to have 100% of your employees put through the request through prior to spending and not afterwards. We can do that, right? That's our goal, yes. But what's the purpose? What's the purpose of this? Why do you care about rogue spending? You know, don't assume the answer based on your experience like the Xerox reps, but ask the customer, why? Why do you care to have a common policy for your employees? Why? And maybe after a few more layers of digging, maybe you discover that they wanted to expand to another office to create 10 more jobs because they were overworked and believe that overspending is, is hindering them from, from reaching that. And maybe to have a common policy would create uniformity in the tools they use and the culture they have because they, that's the culture they're trying to create. So now when you say, hey, Mr. Customer, I need those files from you in order to get things moving to help you work towards opening that new office and hiring those folks to have you less overworked. Or, hey, Ms. VP, I need us to set a time for all of your employees to be in on this training so we can help create that culture you're working towards. Now, all of a sudden, the chances of them complying are, are a ton better. So, now that we've beat the purpose horse to death, we know what it is why you'd want to get there and how to discover it. But now that you know their purpose, what do you do with it? How do, how do you use it? You pair it with a process. Now a purpose is the reason you're doing things, but a process is something that's actionable and it's reachable. It has an objective and a time frame. And together with the purpose, they'll help you reach your goals a crap ton easier than just with either or. Now I'll give you an example. Um, I'm, I'm running a triathlon in a couple weeks here, and it's my purpose is it's one of my pre-40 bucket list accomplishments. I have pre-20s, pre-30s list that I've hit, and this is my pre-40. So say I've hired a personal trainer to help me, which I have, and he continues to cheer me, cheerlead me towards my purpose. He tells me, whenever I feel like giving up, he tells me, hey, Pius, you only turn 40 once, man, and when you hit 41, it doesn't mean anything anymore. This, this doesn't mean anything anymore, so I, I keep going. You know, he reminds me of my bucket list accomplishment and drives me to continue because it's a personal goal and I want to hit it. But am I, am I efficient in my training? Probably not. I mean, sure, I'm motivated, but am I really training to my best way? Now, it's up to my personal trainer to help me. Set goals for me, show me, teach me, 
guide me with his expertise, but use my purpose and drive to motivate me to keep me on track. You know, improve me with your process, but motivate me with my purpose. You know, that being said, with one or the other, with purpose or a process, we still can't achieve our goal. I mean, I can still complete the race without either a process or a purpose. I can do one or the other, but would it be my best? You can still cheer your customer onwards knowing their purpose, but do they know what to do? I mean, they can still make the finish line, but what's, what's the point? I mean, many organizations carry forward like this and still manage to have a decent outcome. But with both, I can optimize my performance to be the best. Now, one alone is fine, but both together really kick ass. And as customer experience professionals, it's up to us to use our expertise and our experience to get our customers there while using their purpose to drive and motivate them to stay on track with a kick-ass experience. Now, there's so many goal-setting strategies and processes out there, so pick one that works for you and pair it with their purpose. Now, I I personally like the smart goal-setting. It works for me. It works for who I'm working with but I really would encourage you to, to find a few and experiment with, with them and, and see what sticks. And that's the most important thing is finding something that's natural for you and finding something that sticks because if it doesn't stick, you're probably not going to use it. Now, for me, I like the SMART goal framework, which is uh, specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, it's relevant, and it's timely. I also like the quick wins methodology and paired together with the SMART goal framework, it's both effective and addicting. Now, quick wins are vital to motivation and to keep us going. It makes us feel good and it makes us say, hey, we did it. We can do this and I'm going to keep doing it. So, for example, my triathlon trainer, he set for me these goals. Run three minutes, walk one minute, repeat until I've run 5K in 40 minutes in weeks one and two. Now, this example is specific. It tells me exactly what I need to achieve. It's measurable. I know how long I'm running for and how long I'm walking for and how far I'm running. It's attainable. I know this based on my past physical experience. He's not telling me to run 20K in half an hour. It's relevant. I'm not learning how to power skate or how to take a perfect slap shot to train for a triathlon. And it's time-based. It's got bi-weekly goals. I know I can do this. And every time I've hit a milestone goal, I feel great. I feel accomplished and I feel like I can take on the next tier and the next tier and keep going. Now for a business, a smart goal might be something like this. Plan and execute five customer education webinars this quarter with a 15 plus attendees per event on 80% higher satisfaction uh, rate per content. Now again, this example is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. Or to add uh, the quick wins methodology along with the SMART goals for our own Procurify example, something like increase user adoption of 55% and decrease rogue spending by 15% in Q2. So this being said, in my experience, the toughest one to gauge within the SMART goal framework is the attainable section. Why? Well, because for this one, we need benchmarks. I, need, I, I knew I could do the run, settle for me in the SMART goals because I know what I could and I couldn't do. It was within my range, but I needed a base for that. Now with our customers, we need to know what their present state is in order to set their future state goals and milestones. Now that that really ties back to how curious you are in terms of the, the answers you discover. Now how many layers of the onion you can peel back? How many layers of questionings can you get through? And how much can you learn and understand about your customers? Again, if you have their deeper purpose in mind, as you ask these sometimes sensitive questions, you'll get a deeper answer. And in specific examples, if the customers themselves don't even know, these quick wins goal setting allows you to benchmark as you're going through the milestones. I mean, maybe they're unable to decrease rogue spending by 15%. Maybe they can only do 3%. Well, you can tweak it milestone two and three. Or maybe 15% is so little and they can hit 30% right off the go. You don't know these things, but along with quick wins, you're able to tweak it as you go. So going back to the questions, when people think you're prying into their business to achieve your goals, they're less inclined to answer you fully. 
versus when people understand that you're trying to learn more about their business to help them, help them achieve their purposes, they'll be much, much more open to go along with the ride. So now we're, we're seeing how everything kind of ties together, you know, nicely is discovery, goals, purpose, process, quick wins, all lead to better adoption, better relationships, and value realization. Now, simply put, once we're able to guide our customers to achieve their goals, because we've done the research, we've done the discoveries, we've tied it back to their purpose, so they stay motivated. Once all that is done, then they'll see what you've seen all along. And now they have clarity and it all makes sense to them now. And they go from a classroom of wild children to those graduates. Now back to what this means for all of us to the original question that I, I put up there in terms of what purpose does it serve us as an organization and as individual contributors? Well, if you take them through the value realization cycle, the value definition starting off is where you discover what their goals are and what their purpose is and why they're doing things. In value delivery, that's when you actually deliver the purpose given to them. But you have their motivation, you have their purpose to guide them along so we are able to deliver the very end goal. It's very hard to deliver the value to your customers without knowing their purpose of doing things. The next step is value realization when they say, ah, oh, I, I see what we're doing here now and everything comes together. Now this is where those statistics that were once just hype and rough estimates beforehand like i want you to achieve 20 percent increase in productivity or 50 percent reduction in rogue spending this in value realization stage is where the customers see it these numbers now actually mean something as the customers have themselves achieved these goals and metrics after being driven by the purpose and the process now your customer goals customer experience goals are hit and after them realizing it this is where you validate it and the customer moves forwards onto value optimization, which is expansion, which hits your organizational goals. So now we've hit your customer experience goals and we've hit our organization goals and we've come full circle with once you've hit their goals and your purpose. So now really to wrap things up, we see how everything ties together. We first have to find out what their goals are, the ones that are relevant to them, and then we go into why those are their goals to discover their purpose and how to do that in the discovery phase by peeling back the layers, by being curious and finding the emotions tied to those goals instead of the generic goals that every company has. Then we can pair the purpose with the process like smart goal setting and quick wins methodology in order to optimize the output and value to our customers leading to client expansion. And then, and then we can sit back and be proud of our children as we send them off into the world. Now it's truly a mutual win-win when client goal setting is successful and something that's infinitely fulfilling as professionals. That's all I have for today. Thank you everybody. I, I hope I was able to share some thoughts and uh, just rearrange some old ones as well. Again, I'm sure this was nothing new that everyone here hasn't heard or knew about already. But I hope you found my stories a little bit interesting and I'd love to hear your thoughts around anything that I discussed today. Thank you again. Uh, this is Pius Chan from Procurify and uh, we'll see you next time.